Stanford University. Well, welcome to the oddly configured class meeting on a Thursday to talk about the aftermath of the election. Of course, the main topic of conversation tonight is the outcome of the election and analyzing the uh, electoral returns. I wanted to mention, though, because it had come up in our, um, our uh, uh, initial conversation, Michael Tubbs. Michael Tubbs is right now the most popular politician in Stockton, 60% victory in the election, 22-year-old serving on the Stockton City Council. An amazing accomplishment, uh, a story worth following, and more than worth following, worth supporting. Secondly, as you all know, we also staged a small contest for predicting uh, the Electoral College outcome, and in the case of any tie, the popular vote. Um, at least as of a couple hours ago, Florida still had not been officially called. Uh, so we're going to wait till next week in order to determine and announce the winner from the class. However, I want to share with you, if, for those of you who are here in the first class, campaign strategy. We asked all of our guests to make predictions. Here was like Chris, Chris Lehane said. Oh, so Chris, <laughs> let me start with you. Are you willing to I go agree. on record with an electoral college prediction? Uh, yes, uh, I, I think, uh, and I'm not going to do the math in my head, but I would take the Obama states that he won uh, in 2008, uh, less Indiana, and I'll say less the Tar Heel State, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and say that that's where he ends up, you know, based on st where we stand right now. That's 332. Thank you very much. That's, that's excellent. <laughs> Mark, what do you think? But, but, but let me finish. But I, but I also think that the margin will not be as anywhere near as big, obviously, as 2008. I actually think the margin will be quite tight because I think the president really has a hard ceiling yeah. based on where the economy is of you know, a little bit over 50%. But even with that a little bit over 50%, given where these swing states are and given um, you know, the electoral votes count counted there, uh, he can end up with a significant electoral college win, but a narrow uh, you know, margin in terms of the percentage. Right. In the meantime, let's turn it over to Jim okay, for introductions. Great. So Rob, thank you very much. So we have three really great guests tonight, and we, I want to introduce them uh, starting on your guys' right. So Simon Jackman is actually the Nate Silver of academia. Mm -hmm. So you guys can just refer to him as Nate over the course of the evening. Uh, he's actually a professor of political science here, and he is one of the principal investigators of the American National Election Studies, which is the most authoritative and longest running survey based of American political behavior. So. Like Professor Segura, who we had in week one, Simon is really one of the great experts in the country on the whole data and polling that goes beneath this. And you will hear a lot from him this evening about how this election played out according to the polls. Next to him is Tom Steyer. Uh, Tom uh, is, if, is, if you guessed, he's actually my brother. Um, but uh, he's not here. <laughs> he's not here because he's my brother. He's here because. He's also one of the, one of the distinguished uh, trustees of Stanford University, vice chairman of the board of Stanford. For the past 25 years or so, he's been the founding partner and, and, and head of a, of a large uh, investment firm, Farallon Capital, uh, from which he just announced his retirement a couple of weeks ago. Um, Tom uh, is the father of four kids, uh, who are all of whom are, are out of high school and at various schools back on the East Coast. Um, Tom, in addition to his experience as, a, as an investor, has done some of the most important philanthropic work here in the Bay Area and around the country over the past couple of decades. He and his wife, Kat Taylor, who's also a Stanford JD MBA, started uh, one California bank now called One Pacific Coast Bank, which is one of the largest community investment banks in the United States. Tom, in the most recent California election, in this funded with the primary funder and instigator of Prop 39, the initiative on the ballot that closed the multi-state loophole in California and will put about $1.1 billion a year into green jobs and renewable energy efficiency here in the state of California. <laughs> prior to that, two years ago, prior to that, two years ago, Tom also was the principal funder of the opposition of Prop 23, which was the, which was the effort by the large oil companies to overturn the environmental regulations in the state of California. And Tom, again, was the principal organizer and, and uh, uh, and not organizer and funder behind that. Uh, Tom works with me uh, on a new organization that you'll hear a lot more about over the coming years called the Center for the Next Generation, which is focused on two major issues, kids and education issues, and, 
energy climate change issues, which we see as a, a vehicle for, for promoting the importance of those issues both here in California and across the country. And um, I am very proud of my brother because of what he has done in everything in his life since he and I shared a room for 20 something years. <laughs> Uh, and I think you will find him fascinating tonight. We expect him to talk a lot about what happened in the California electorate in this last election. On his, on his uh, right from left from your guys' standpoint is Steve Schmidt. Steve uh, is one of the, the great uh, campaign strategists in, in the United States. He was going to come the first night with Lahane McKinnon et al. Um, he is best known probably for being Arnold Schwarzenegger's campaign manager and building Arnold's successful campaign here in California then being John McCain's campaign manager in 2008. Um, when he spoke at Rob's in my class a couple of years ago, he said, the one thing I refuse to talk about is the selection of Sarah Palin as, as vice president. And then Stanford students' first 10 questions were about the selection of Sarah Palin. So you can, we'll ask him about that tonight. Um, two, three little known facts you should know about Steve. He's obviously a brilliant campaign strategist. Is number one, he has two kids. And one on the way. He lives here, in the, so he is about to be a father again for the third time. Uh, number two, I have a question for the audience. Who played Steve in the movie Game Change, the movie about the 2008 election? Woody Harrelson. So we may refer him as Woody tonight. And his real nickname is The Bullet. That's all I'll tell you. He is well known in political circles as The Bullet because of his acumen and perhaps his hairstyle. So with no further ado, we have Steve Schmidt, Tom Steyer, and Simon Jackman. This should be a great conversation. I turn it over to David and Rob to introduce them, and then they get to make their introductory statements. You can just so, start, start with your five minutes. Steve, so we're going to give them yeah. each five minutes to say whatever they want to say. I just want to say, with regard to hairstyles, um, I was thinking if I get a transplant, I'm going to get the Jim Steyer. <laughs> my, uh, um, well, it's a pleasure uh, to be here this evening to uh, talk about the election. Um, First thing to think about demographically in the country, the last presidential candidate who got 60% of the white vote uh, was George Herbert Walker Bush in 1988. 24 years ago, if you got 60% of the white vote, you got 404 electoral college votes, and you won in a landslide. Uh, 24 years later, 60% of the white vote leads you, uh, uh, yields you a pretty convincing electoral college defeat. Uh, I was a senior strategist on the Bush campaign in 2004. We received 44% of the Hispanic vote in the country. When it's all said and done here, Mitt Romney nationally will receive 26, 27% of the Hispanic vote, and that number will be lower in a number of the key swing states, fastest growing demographic in the country. And my party's deliberate strategy over the last eight years to antagonize them has paid <laughs> off uh, brilliantly. <laughs> um, uh, David Petraeus, when he took command in Iraq, he said that he had as a goal uh, to wake up every morning with uh, fewer enemies uh, and more friends. And apply that to politics, the goal of a political party uh, should be to wake up every morning with more supporters and, and fewer opponents. There's two types of churches, just like there's two types of political parties. There's the type of church that goes out and hunts heretics, uh, goes out and tries to find the non-believers, the non-100% purists, and drown them. <laughs> and there's the type of church that goes out and tries to seek converts. Now, Reaganism, as a political philosophy, Ronald Reagan talked about the fact that someone who agrees with me 80% of the time is not my political opponent. They're my political ally, and that is a sentiment uh, that Republicans would be well served to, to remember. When you think about Hispanics, if you were to play a word association game with members of Congress in the, in the Republican Party, and you were to say, for example, Latino, uh, the response would likely to be illegal immigrant uh, or immigration as opposed to perhaps Silver Star winner, or fireman, or teacher, or doctor, or lawyer. And indisputably, our country is richer for the contribution of our uh, Hispanic American citizens. And the Republican Party had better figure out a way to reach out to this demographic, which, by the way, is entrepreneurial, is the number one net contributor to military service in this country. Um, 
are steeped in traditional values. And unless and until we do, and unless and until we stop allowing guys like Tom Tancredo and Steve King, the congressman from, from Iowa, to be our forward face to this community, uh, we will continue to devolve from a once great <coughs> national party to a regional southern party uh, that's based as southern evangelical Christians. And that will uh, be a great disservice to the, to the country if that's allowed to happen. And let me also point out that this election was remarkable in that we gave up in two election cycles our fourth and fifth U.S. Senate seats because of the nomination of absolute and complete loony birds <laughs> in, in five U.S. Senate seats. So Sharon Angle and Ken Buck and Christine O'Donnell are now joined by Richard Murdoch and, of course, Todd Aiken in Missouri. And this had a spillover effect into any number of other U.S. Senate races. Conservatism uh, is a political philosophy that's a serious political philosophy. It's a serious governing philosophy. And, the, and, that, and that philosophy has served this country well over its history. And the vessel that advances conservatism is the, is the Republican Party. Uh, but for swing voters in the country, conservatism has now come to mean to too many of them intolerance and looniness. And it's being rejected. And so now we have to, as a party, I think, have leaders that stand up and confront some elements of the conservative entertainment complex. Um, conservatism <laughs> and who is and who is not a real conservative should not be defined by fidelity to the most outrageous statements of our talk radio hosts. Uh, they are the tail on the dog, but that tail has been wagging the dog, and it has had a significant electoral consequence that Republicans need to wrestle with. When you have statements made by guys like Mark Levin or, or Rush Limbaugh that because now of the election or re-election of the president, we have crossed the line from liberty to tyranny, and we stand now on the precipice of a thousand years of darkness, and these people are heralded as the leading intellectual lights of the party, it's time for serious people to stand up and to say enough is enough and no more. Um, and, and so now we come to a moment where the parties begin to debate uh, the so-called fiscal cliff and the sequestration votes, and we stand at the precipice of a politically induced economic crisis that will put the country back into a recession, according to every serious economist in the world. And our system of government, from the very beginning, uh, requires compromise. Um, as a political philosophy, the notion of never compromising is antithetical to the American experiment. The goal here is not to not compromise. The goal here is to get the best deal you can get for your, for your beliefs. And for the entire history of the country, people who profoundly disagree with each other uh, and who oftentimes don't like each other very much have been able to sit across the table and to do the business of the American people. And so now that we have reelected the president and reelected a Republican House and added two seats to the Democratic majority, the American people, I think, have an expectation that all of these parties are able to sit down together and to do the business of the country and to make some progress on any one of a number of important fiscal issues. And I believe for those that are intransigent and obstructionist in the days ahead, there will just be absolute hell to pay um, if progress is not made and this country tips into a recession not because of a cyclical economic cycle, but because of the malfeasance of our politicians. Um, so the Republican Party, I think, tonight has a lot of soul searching to do, uh, really has to rethink uh, its position on a number of issues, and recognize, last but not least, uh, that a majority of voters in this country are now women. And I'll leave with this last thought. Um, as Jim pointed out, um, married with a third kid on the way. I've been married for 12 years, and 
Um, outside of my marriage, I have no idea how any one of my other 330 million Americans uses birth control, uh, with the exception of Rick Santorum. <laughs> and, um, and I don't know why he wants to talk about it and why he wants to talk about it to, to me, um, but, um, or more importantly, to, um, to the ladies in the room, to you. And so in a country where 52, 53 percent of the electorate is women, for sure, they don't want a bunch of middle-aged white guys in the Republican Party talking to them about their reproductive health. And it's time, I think, again, for the, for the limited government party, uh, which we should be, to get the hell out of the bedroom window. And unless and until we do, uh, we're going to continue to lose support among demographics that we used to do very well with. Uh, with women in suburbs all over the country because they are rejecting uh, the social extremism of the party. And this will be uh, a great fight ahead inside the Republican Party as we embark upon the early days of a civil war after an election that saw a fundamental change in the coalition that elects the president. And just a significant change is the change that occurred with the coalition realignment under FDR, under Ronald Reagan, and now under Barack Obama. Well, thank you very much, and enjoy getting into it tonight. Thank you. Tom. Tom. So um, unlike Steve, I'm a Democrat. And I look at the political scene from two different angles. One is, as Jim mentioned, uh, I started an investment fund. so knowing what's going on in national politics is something that's going to impact virtually every single investment we have. So I spend a lot of time. I was a, a delegate to the Democratic Convention in 04 and 08, and I spoke at the Democratic Convention in this summer. So I try and keep my hand in in terms of talking to people who are involved in the campaign nationally, both in the presidential race and the um, congressional races and Senate races, partially just from a selfish investment standpoint, and partially because I really care about it. And I also was very involved in the California races this year because we were running, and, and Jim was actually too nice to me, I was co-chairing the Proposition 39 with George Schultz, who works at Stanford and who is a Republican because everything I've done in California has been bipartisan. But so I've, I was very tightly watching what was going on in California and also pretty tightly watching the stuff that was going on nationally. And I have a slightly different take on it than Steve because I'm a Democrat and I, you know, I, I watch what his party is doing from the outside, not from the inside. And what I would point out is this. California is always credited with leading the nation. And you know, we've led the nation in a whole bunch of attitudes and we've let, led the nation in a whole bunch of businesses and ways of thinking. And actually, I think we're leading the nation now. So when you when you're thinking about what's going on in national politics, I think it's quite instructive to observe what's been happening in our home state for the last 10 years. Because in terms of the demographic changes that are going on in the United States, they have already happened in California. So all the things that Steve was talking about in terms of the makeup of the country and who votes and how that's changing outcomes, if you get the same percentage of the same groups, you don't get the same outcome. That's been true in California for much, for much longer. And so that's been the reality here. We're also the state that went bankrupt long before the United States of America went bankrupt, <laughs> which is not a trivial fact, because in fact, we've been, we've been lurching as a state from crisis to crisis with absolutely no ability for the two parties to get together and make the kind of compromises that Steve is, in my opinion, completely accurately saying are essential. So we, we went bankrupt first. We changed demographically first. And we had the, we've had the kind of partisanship, you know, extreme partisanship here for at least 10 years. So when Steve is saying, which I think is completely true, that it's going to be increasingly difficult for any national candidate to win who alienates women and alienates Latinos and alienates young people, which is really what you know, I saw <coughs> happening this summer on the national race, that has been true in the state of California for a long time because the Republican Party ran some props that were perceived as anti-Latino over 10 years ago. And I remember watching somebody running for governor, uh, I, I, Bill Simon, who, who basically had a platform that meant on day one he could not be elected. 
I mean, it was one of those things where you, you felt like calling the guy up and saying, seriously, don't spend $1 because you have no chance whatsoever. It, but it's really true. So what we've seen in California, I, I don't know, no one really reported this in a big way. I guess it was in the Cron this morning, that basically the Democratic Party got super majorities in both the Senate and the legislature on Tuesday. That is an incredible fact. That makes the Republicans basically a non-event. They have had a, basically a negative veto on legislation, which meant that very little could get done, which is really, and, and that's no longer true. We are now a one-party state. It, it, the Republicans, in effect, hung on to an ideology that became increasingly unpopular to the extent that they now really don't have to be consulted, which is a gigantic change in the state of California. There's some other things that are going on here that are going on in the country. It happened here first, and you can see the noxious effects. One of them's money. It is impossible for a normal person to run for office in the state of California statewide because it is so expensive. And people here really raise the money from special interest groups. They really do. I mean, if you, it, it, it's one of those things where it's so expensive that you really need to have backers. And that is something which is, an, the people who I've met in politics, by and large, go into it for the right reasons. They're very competent, they're very smart, and in general, they're much more idealistic than they get credit for. But it is very hard for them to have a, have a, um, you know, a career, to move from job to job, to get backing, unless they're specific groups who absolutely back them and who support them through thick and thin. And that is something which is, it's been true in, in American politics, but now it's especially true because it, you know, if you want to run statewide in, in California, if you looked, I think it's like at least $40 million if you're running for one of the big statewide offices, at least $40 million. And people, you know, that is an enormous amount of money for somebody who's basically an entrepreneur to raise during a year unless there are people who think, wow, this is somebody who's going to support something that I am desperately interested in. Um, I think the other thing that's true in California is we've had very low approval ratings before the Congress of the United States had very low approval ratings. <laughs> that's a huge fact. You know, I always joke around and I say, if Ceausescu in Romania had had a 10% approval rating, the, we would have argued as Americans he was a de facto dictator because he, you know, basically that's his family in the army. And we would have said, no one likes Ceausescu. Well, that's what we have. You know, we have incredibly low approval ratings for our legislators in the state of California, and that has been subsequently followed by very low approval ratings by the Congress of the United States. So there's something that is breaking down in our system in terms of representative democracy. Happened here first, is happening on a broad scale, and you know, I, I think that we can see here what we've done, which is not available to the United States of America, is we've gone to propositions. I, every and outside the state of California, and many people in the state of California, feel like we have lost our collective minds. That basically, if you go back and think about it, we've done death penalty, we've done three strikes, we've done gay marriage, we've done tax rates, we have done virtually every major social question. We have asked ourselves, the 37 million people of California, what is the right thing to do? When the governor of California wanted to raise taxes, he put it in a proposition. So we have been, in effect, conducting a massive experiment in direct democracy, unannounced, quite reviled, as a matter of fact, and where increasingly people are using it as a way to educate each other on issues, some of them quite complicated. I mean, Prop 39 was at the bottom of the list. It was not you know, something that people were wildly uh, excited about. But it was something that in order for people to, it, to me it was an absolute slam dunk to get a billion dollars from out-of-state corporations just to make them pay taxes like us. But in order to educate 37 million Californians is no minor task who do not spend their nights thinking about tax rates for out-of-state corporations, I promise you. On a very crowded ballot where there were a lot of emotional issues that people were very excited about. Um, I would like to make, there are a couple other things I'll say and I'll end. One is TV, the way to reach people is really changing. I mean, we could really see this time. The, the traditional way to re reach people is TV ads, and increasingly fewer people are watching TV, and those who watch TV don't watch the ads. So, you, you know, the ads are getting more expensive, and they're reaching many fewer people. 
That's one thing that's definitely happening. The polling is a million times better. You know, I was watching these polls in state and then state by state in the, in the, in the different elections, and it was incredible. I mean, Chris Lehane really is a smart guy. I mean, I know Christopher, but you could go state by state, and they weren't wrong. There was no Dewey beats Truman this time. There was no huge thing where you said, wow, you're kidding me. The turnout was completely different from what these professional pollsters, it's gotten a lot better, which kind of makes it a little less fun, I think. Um, I think in the election, I, what Steve was talking about really to me is this breakdown in the Republican Party where they had a very significant influx of energy and passion around the Tea Party. And, you know, I thought that that was, you know, so to me that was a renewal of a kind of nativist strain in American politics that's been here for hundreds of years. And I have always said, and of course I'm a Democrat, so this isn't supposed to be fair, but I've always said the Tea Party was like the Know Nothing Party of 1848. They wanted to keep people out. They, at that point, they were upset about Catholics. And they wanted to support Abraham Lincoln, who was running for Congress, because you know, he was like traditional American stock. He was from Lincolnshire. He was a backwoodsman, perfect guy. And he basically said, I don't want your support. That is not what the United States is about. And I really have always felt that even though they were answering some real questions and their energy was coming from a real unhappiness in terms of fiscal sanity, which I think that's a real thing to worry about, I thought there was a strain in there which was gonna kill the Republicans if they gave into it, which was gonna be basically trying to close the door on new Americans. And, and I think that that's been part of you know, American society for hundreds of years, and it's something that always fails because America is about, as Steve said, it's about including the new people. It's about the new energy. It's about people who wanna come here and work really hard. So I always felt like that was something that would be terrible for the Republicans, and I agree with Steve. We don't work unless they're two competent, valuable, coherent parties who are working for the good of the country, maybe in different ways. But we are, having a one-party state, to me, is not something that I look forward to because there is really no check. That is not what we're about. And the last thing I'd say is this. I spend a lot of time thinking about fiscal policy, believe it or not. I mean, I am that boring. <laughs> and I think the way to think about fiscal policy is really simple. We have a huge deficit. We've had a huge deficit because we were trying to basically not go through a horrible recession after 2008. And so we basically blew up the deficit then. And we still have pretty much the same deficit. And we've been living pretty well, but we are really like the family that's you know, still going to Hawaii for vacation, even though they're doing it on their credit cards. And the way to think about this deficit is from St. Augustine in whatever he was, like the 15th century, whose statement was, dear, <laughs> fifth century, dear God, dear God, make me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> and that's exactly where we are on the deficit. Dear God, make us fiscally you know, responsible, but please, not yet. So I, I look at this and I thought, I thought this election was in many ways, it was, I mean, honestly, it was a home run for Democrats pretty much, with the exception of the House. And, but more than that, I think there is something going on in terms of people being involved, certainly in the state of California, that is completely new. And I don't know where that's gonna take us, but I, I view us as having very significant problems, the existing political system having a huge problem in addressing them. That, you know, to me, the biggest, one of the biggest issues we're dealing with is energy, and no one addressed that directly, I didn't think, in the campaign because it was too politically difficult. So I look for this election as a jumping off point for, I think, a new way of thinking politically and a chance for us to really move forward as a country. Simon. Simon. Okay, so I'm gonna go over to the podium in, uh, in just a second and do a little bit of show and tell, but before I do that, um, there was another part of this election that was interesting that, that Tom alluded to, and, uh, and that was the sort of the battle between uh, punditry and, uh, and data uh, that, that came into um, sharp contrast in the, uh, in the dying weeks of the campaign in particular when 
um, you know, Nate Silver in particular, you know, came into the crosshairs of some people predominantly on the right, uh, you know, that, that the projections he was making couldn't possibly be right. Um, people have sort of blown that up a little bit and made, made a lot more of that, that the, the, the left, the Democrats, get data now and, and, the, and, and, the, and the Republicans don't. I, I think that's way overstated. But, but nonetheless, it, 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 was, it was interesting and, and sort of silver um, became sort of the, uh, the lightning rod for, for this debate. And it seems a debate a lot of people wanted to have. It sort of seemed to accord with a lot of prejudices out there about, about the, the way, you know, the, uh, the re unconstrained by reality Republicans and the, you know, uh, close to the data uh, Democrats. Um, so um, a little bit about my, my piece in this. Um, I've taught at Stanford since 1997. Um, I came to the United States from Australia in the mid-80s, attracted by the proposition that private universities will support the scientific study of politics, a uh, remarkable idea, um, and, and got me out of Australia as a, as a, as a young guy, and, and I've been in the US for a long time since. I came to Stanford in 97, and in, and in 2000, a colleague of mine started an internet company down here in Menlo Park that was starting to do survey research online. And what Doug Rivers um, wanted to know was how were the numbers he was producing from then, this novel technology, how did that accord with what the rest of the polling industry was saying? So he brought me in to basically develop a model that I wish I'd really written a book around at the time. Um, is it essentially the silver uh, setup? And that is, there are oodles of state level polls out there now. There are even more oodles of national level polls out there. And they're in the field over the course of the campaign. And it's, and it's with a little bit of statistical knowledge uh, and, a, and a bit of computation, it's possible to build up a picture of where the electorate is sort of day by day over the course of the campaign. Now, those on the outside of campaigns you know, know that inside the campaigns, they're doing their tracking and, and what have you in key states. But what happened was around about 2000, and, and certainly since 2000, you'll recall the 2000 campaign is what reminded Americans that they have this thing called an electoral college. But, but around about 2000, the cycle I first got into this, more and more state level polls became available. The media started to realize they should be commissioning polls and publishing polls out of the swing states because essentially that's where the election would be decided. So for years we've had national polls, but in around about 2000, something started to change and we started to get enough data out of the states as well to start to do what Silver does. And not just Nate, but, but me and another guy I should mention at Emory, Drew Linzer had a great cycle this time around, uh, self-publishing off his own website. There's a guy at uh, Princeton called Sam Wang essentially doing the same exercise. And we've all sort of fallen essentially into the same model um, that, that I won't talk about tonight, um, but, but, but more to show you some of the output of it in just a second. Um, and so what that model showed this time around, and, and well, I'll just say a little bit about the data. This cycle sort of it just went even every, time, every four years, there's just more and more data available to do this with. Uh, the swing states in particular, you didn't need to be Aristotle to know that there were going to be nine key states, say, this cycle. And all the campaigns know it, the polling companies know it, and there were so much polls coming out of, say, Ohio, Florida, Virginia, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Iowa, New Hampshire, Colorado, Nevada, right? Out of that handful of states, that's where the action was. And there was so much polling data there that we were able to produce you know, pretty good pictures of, of what was happening uh, in those states. Um, and the essential message, it's, it's Nate's message, it's, it's a, a good statistical message, is that you want to look at an average. Any given poll is going to be subject to its limitations of sample size and of biases that try as they might, or try sometimes as they, as they don't might. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Um, maybe this is the time I go over. Um, <laughs> Try as they might, um, they, they, they can't get rid of. And, and so, um, um, and so the, the models essentially put all that data together and apologize to my fellow panelists. It's going to be very difficult for them to see what I'm showing the audience. Um, it's very difficult for them. Um, uh, it, it, we, we can, anyway, the bottom line is we can produce this, this state level picture that's pretty good. Um, here is the picture from at least my model uh, at the national level. Uh, and each little piece of confetti 
is a poll. Uh, it's a national level poll. And there were, by the time we got done, I mean, there are literally, there are over 200 pollsters contributed data. There were over 1,300 polls in the public domain that pitched a Obama-Romney matchup at some point in calendar year 2012, right? Most of them were at the national level, to be sure, right? And, and, and what you can see is that um, Obama never really tra trailed Romney. It got a little close after the first debate. There's the, the loop down after the first debate. Romney was in reasonable shape after he secured the nomination. But basically, the national polling suitably treated through these models that Silver runs, that I run, that a whole bunch of us run now, never really showed um, Romney ever in front, really, nationally. A few polls, in fact, a bunch of polls, actually, around the time of the first debate did that. But particularly in the home stretch, the last week of the campaign in particular, um, Obama really started to accelerate away. And, and in the last four days, sort of post-Sandy, um, one troubling thing that we'd, we'd been seeing in, in the, say, Labor Day onwards is that Obama wasn't doing as well in the national polls, and a few national polls actually had him losing. You know, at one point, we were starting to have to put, contemplate the possibility of a mismatch between the popular vote and the electoral vote. That sort of just disappeared really quickly in the, in the last week of, of post-Sandy polling in particular, that everything sort of came together. And numbers like 332 on the Electoral College that people thought, well, wow, that's a really high number uh, for a president who isn't taking exactly the best re-election docket uh, to the American people. That's a high number, but wow, it looks like they're going to get there. Um, and, and that was one of the stories out there. And, and so what's the point of that story? The point of that story is to sort of say, you know, those of us, this, is, this data was in the public domain. Silver was publishing this stuff every day. A whole bunch of us were. Um, any, that was there for anybody who cared to look, frankly. Um, um, that, when you look at it state by state, too, and I'll show you the Ohio picture now, um, and I can make that a little bit bigger for you, even. Um, now, how do you read that one? The black line is Obama's share of the two-party vote, right? The solid, the dark black line. And the gray area is what our statisticians call a confidence interval. It's our margin of error, if you will, our uncertainty hedge. We're not quite sure where it is, but I want you to look. It's never near 50, right? The black line is never near 50. He was never in doubt. In the public polling, Ohio was never on the table, as best as we could tell from the public polling, right? This idea that, and, and that was the state, really. You looked at how Romney could get to 270, and if Ohio wasn't one of those states, it wasn't going to happen. Right? And it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> right? You can see um, there, uh, Obama gets as high as about 53 and a half, two party terms. But in the end, and, and maybe Steve might talk about the campaign in a moment, one of the remarkable things about the Ohio result is that um, it, it, it tracks the national really well, but they held the, the Obama team there held the swing against them nationally. Ohio did not, every, everywhere is, Obama didn't do as well as he did in 08, right? So the vote has come down everywhere. But not as much in Ohio. Ohio sort of bucked the trend a bit. At various points in the campaign, not only did it look like Obama was polling better relative to national trend in Ohio, he was polling better than 08. At, at, at the high point for Obama, it looked like they might even improve on their 08 result. They knew what states they had to win. They went and did it with, with great skill. And, 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 and that's why I think in the dying days of the campaign, and again, something Steve might be able to talk about, the Romney campaign are trying to find other pathways. Because I'm sure their data are probably showing something similar. Ohio just isn't moving, despite the insane amount of money that's being spent there, right? And the amount of campaign resources you're devoting there with visits from the candidate. Right? You've got to put some other states in play. Um, but, but again, the point would be that to, to you know, right of center punditry, this was a picture we was, I was seeing, Nate Silver was talking about consistently. Like this, this was what the data was saying. Um, and we'll talk about. There's the final electoral college picture 
we presented. Now again, this is something that might make sense if you've taken a stats class, but what it does, it basically says, how certain are we that a given electoral college count is likely to happen given what we're seeing in the state-by-state -state breakouts? And so the higher the bar on top of any given electoral college outcome, the more likely we think that's going to happen. And 332 and 347 even, were on the morning of the election when I ran my number crunching algorithm for the last time before putting it to bed for the year. Those were the two numbers that, 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 that come out. These are uh, uh, denominated in terms of Obama electoral college counts. The probability that we would get an Obama electoral college count of 269 or lower, meaning either a tie in the electoral college or a Romney victory, that had diminished to 9%. But that's how confident, that's how strong the message from the polls was by the last three or four days of the campaign. Again, using publicly available information. Um, so it wasn't just a Nate thing, it was a data thing, right? And Silver has become the lightning rod for this, right? But, but, but he was seeing this, I was seeing this, Sam Wang was seeing this. Everybody was seeing this. I presume the campaigns were seeing this too, to be quite honest with you. And, and that might start a conversation about, you know, why certain media organizations spin certain polls certain ways and others don't. Um, the last thing I'll show you is to make the case for data is to show where my state-by-state -state estimates wound up. And like Silver, like four or five other people, I went 51 for 51. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, um, um, we, we, we ended election morning, uh, Florida absolutely line ball. The last polls out of Florida suggested it would just sneak over the line, um, but we weren't at all confident with that. I think I, I attached a 52% probability to Obama winning Florida, which thankfully I get to say 51-51 because that coin came up heads for me and a bunch of other people too. Um, and, um, but, but again, that's, that's one of the, the other takeaways of this election, just how well you're able to do now with the polls that are out there. I'm not going to say any given poll is great, right? But <laughs> polls collectively were this cycle, right? And, and that's an interesting point as well. There are, there are polls that will um, trend um, left of center, right? Overstating Democratic support, sometimes by as much as four points on the margin, right? And then there are polls out there doing the other, the other thing on the Republican side, right? That will overstate Romney's support. But if you can find a way, and, and that's what tools like statistics give us, find a way to average over all of that, you nail it, pretty much. Um, we, did, we did quite well. Um, I, I don't know if we'll be able to repeat that in 2016. Um, this is not like studying atoms. Um, <laughs> humans know they're being measured. And, and sometimes do devious things to hide their true intentions from us. Um, polling isn't a cheap thing, and the technology out there for polling is changing as well. Um, but um, we'll see where 16 goes. And, and frankly, I'm, I'm happy to talk about the polls. I found what Steve had to say and what Tom had to say about the future of the country, frankly, um, um, more compelling. Uh, than, than, than the future of uh, statistical averaging of polls. But, but, uh, but, I'm, but, I'm, but, I'm, but I'm delighted to uh, take any questions. We'll see where the conversation takes us. Well, I've got a question for you, Steve Schmidt. Uh, you've lived up to your reputation. Uh, no fur on your tongue, as they say in Italy. You don't mince any words, and I think that was much appreciative by everybody in this room. Uh, but I want to just take us back a little bit historically, and my topic here is the Republican Party. Uh, you'll remember, and many other people will too, Kevin Phillips wrote a book in the late 1960s called The Emerging Republican Majority, and there was a lot of theoretical apparatus behind it about why we were about to transition to a long three-plus decade period of a solid Republican majority. Didn't quite happen. Karl Rove comes along roughly three decades later and says, well, we flubbed it in 1968, but we're going to nail it in 2000 or 2004. That didn't quite happen either. Nonetheless, uh, for uh, 28 of the last 44 years, we've had Republican presidents. And the Republican Party was a pretty healthy party until fairly recently. And now it seems to have gone around the bend. Uh, you, you, some of the language you use tonight seems to indicate that you agree with that. So my question is, how did that happen? 
Uh, Wall Street Journal this morning had an article in which they said that the, the running joke is now that the GOP is becoming the WOP, not the grand old party, but the white old party. <laughs> Um, and it, it, it appears poised, as you were suggesting, if it doesn't mend its ways, to be a permanent or long-term minority party. So to, to put it just to you directly, where were voices like the voice we heard from you tonight for the last several years? What's happened to your party that it's got itself in this pickle? Well, a lot of, a lot of our elected officials are frankly scared to death of being criticized by the talk radio hosts. Uh, by the Rush Limbaugh's of the world. Now, the fact of the matter, in 2008, um, and I got involved in John McCain's race after the campaign staff had quit and the campaign had gone bankrupt and he was in last place and began to mount a comeback in the Republican primary. And as we climbed in the polls, Rush Limbaugh and these guys did everything but, you know, come personally and throw <coughs> kitchen sinks at us. He did everything he possibly could in a Republican primary to stop John McCain from being the nominee. And, it didn't work. They don't determine who, who votes. They don't actually have an electoral influence. It's all illusory. It's all Wizard of, the, uh, Wizard of Oz stuff, man behind the, man behind the curtain. It's, it's illusory power. But nevertheless, our elected officials are scared to death, and they don't go out, and they don't stand up to it. Now, I think more broadly speaking, there have been three legs of the Republican stool, social conservatives, fiscal conservatives, uh, and national security conservatives. And I think a hugely important moment in the modern history of the Republican Party was the Terry Schiavo case. Um, and I think it was a tipping point moment. So um, I'm a, I am a moderate Republican, um, but as a conservative, um, and I do consider myself a conservative, I'm a traditionalist. So if you want to take uh, the Virgin Mary statue and cover it in dog crap and put it in the public art museum with, with, with public ta tax dollars. You know what? I'm with you, Pat Robertson. We're not going to do that. Um, you want to take the Ten Commandments off the courthouse wall where they've hung for 150 years? You know what? I'm with you, Jerry Falwell. It's a historical monument. Leave it be. You, you want to bring the President of the United States back to the White House early to sign an act of Congress intervening in a state family court decision? And we're the Federalist Party? We're the limited government party? I can't be there with you on that. Because the only thing more, object, uh, more objectionable than a big government liberal in every aspect of your business life is a big government conservative peering through the, peering through the window trying to regulate end-of-life decisions and all manner of other issues. And then... Our party, if you go back and you read Conscious of a Conservative by Barry Goldwater, he talked, yes, tax cuts, but deficit reduction first. And the only thing more appalling than um, you know, $9 trillion in new debt over four years, or whatever the, whatever, the, whatever the actual number is, I'm blanking on it for a second, is the $4 trillion in debt over eight, under eight years of a Republican president that I worked for and I, and I like very much. But we lost our brand with our fiscal uh, profligacy under the delay Congress and the, and the Bush administration. And then lastly, uh, Republican presidents um, were trusted with the national security of the country. And one of the great uh, uh, aspects of the campaign, the great transitions, is the fact that Republicans have lost their lead on national security issues um, over the last decade as we have um, had foreign policy misadventures. Um, we have had an incompetently run war. And so the stool has collapsed on, on, all, of these, on, all, of these, on all of these issues. Now, th the one thing that I would disagree a bit with Tom on with regard to the Tea Party um, is, is this. The Tea Party was not just a reaction to the Obama presidency, although that's in part. It was as much a reaction to the Bush presidency and the fiscal issues that you, that you talked about, but it also contains many of the other elements that, that, you, that you mentioned. But conservatism as a philosophy requires an attachment to reality. <laughs> and when you look at, let's say, a Christine O'Donnell, and the conservative dogma requires you to say, Oh, yes, this person should absolutely be in the U.S. Senate. 
People that are in the middle of the electorate, who swing back and forth between the parties, who uh, are with Republicans, they just can't go there. And so we have a, we have a, we have a, we have a lot of thinking to do. And the last piece is this. Um, if, you look at, if you look at Ronald Reagan and his presidency, Ronald Reagan had an agenda um, that fit the problems and the challenges of the time. The problems and the challenges that the country faced in 1980 are very different than the problems and the challenges that the country faces in 2012. So we need to have a platform and policy ideas that fit the, the policies of the, uh, the that, that fit the challenges of the of the time. And I remember in the McCain campaign in 2008, as we had the policy guys around, and I, you know, said it that you know, in the meeting, I said, I know how to market these things. I know how to drive a message and sell them. But on all of these challenges, what should our plan be, right? And there were no new ideas. There was an intellectual stagnation in the party. And remember at the meeting, after a long, frustrating period when it was not possible to come up with any new ideas, I said, Looks like it's going to be tax cuts for the rich and endless war. All right, we'll go with that. Um, and and um, so, so we're going to need to have a, a renaissance in the Republican Party of, of, def, of, 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 of looking at the challenges the country faces and coming up with innovative solutions on everything from the investments we need to make in infrastructure, in technology, in science, uh, what do we do to deal with a real issue like income inequality, uh, wage stagnation in the middle class? These are, these are real things. Um, there are you know, policy differences that I have with, with, with Obamacare for sure, and I don't think that it will contain costs. I think the inflation in health care will continue to rise. But for example, the fact that there's 50 million people who are uninsured and don't have access to any health care, but the most expensive health care in the world, the emergency room, that is a problem in need of a solution that the Republican Party as an institution should begin to get its arms around. So unless and until we do these things, um, we will continue to exist in that space that the Democrats were in in the you know, 1980, 84, 88 period, the British Labor Party was in, over the course of the, of the early 1980s, but out of defeat comes renewal. And so uh, it is true um, that after victory, when you are at the highest point on the mountain, is also the moment before the, the inevitable decline that, that <laughs> follows. And when you, are, when you are in the deepest valley, and as John McCain would say, quoting Chairman Mao, it's always darkest before it's completely black, <laughs> um, you would. Um, you are in your next step on that ascension up out of that place. Just a just a quick follow up question. Where where, where do you, where do you look in the Republican Party for the leadership to uh, undertake the Renaissance? So though it was great entertainment over the course of the primary campaigns, I mean, those folks on that debate stage. Uh, they should all be in a treehouse with Simon Cowell or something, <laughs> you know, with the exception of Mitt Romney. I mean, it was, it was a reality show. Um, and, I, and, I thought, and I thought during the debates that one thing we could have done to improve the entertainment value is like, for example, when Rick Perry couldn't name the three cabinet <laughs> departments, I think there should have been a trap door under them. And it dropped, <laughs> dropped down. But, um, but I think those folks um, who were there in the, in the last cycle, uh, we're going to have serious people up there next time. Uh, we're going to have people like Chris Christie, and I think Jeb Bush, um, and yes, Paul Ryan, uh, but maybe a Bobby Jindal. Uh, we're going to have some effective leaders of government who are up on that, up on that stage. And I think uh, you know, the Herman Cain's of the world will continue to flourish in, in the entertainment complex that has sprung up <laughs> around politics. But I think we have crossed the bridge where we're going to have some serious people. How about your sweetheart time. from Wasilla? 
I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, I'm going to put... I'm not, I, I'm not allowed to say her name out loud. <laughs> Steve, I, I want to put one, one more world. thing in the table that, that um, I thought you might have mentioned, or at least I want to get your, your take on it. So you, you, you talked about the illusory power of the conservative talk radio hosts and the, 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 the seeming fidelity that, that politicians, conservatives, um, seem to uh, want to hold them to. Um, um, and you also talked about the importance of compromise, the idea that someone who agrees with me 80% of the time is my friend, not my, not my enemy. I, I wonder if you can talk about Grover Norquist in that context and the no tax pledge, which is a spirit of no compromise at all and holds seemingly powerful sway over the Republican Party. So, look, I think um, when Democrats talk about paying your fair share, Right, and let's say you're a million dollar earner now in the state of California, where I think the top rate is now 12 and a half percent, and you have a um, you have a top federal tax rate. Let's say goes back up to the Bush rates at 39 percent. Is the argument that 53 percent of your income isn't your fair share? Um, what's the number that you hit when you're paying your paying your fair share? I, I would argue that 35 percent of your income going to the going to the federal government. Is a lot of your is a lot of your income and a sufficient level of personal taxation. In fact, I think it's probably an excessive level of of of, um, of taxation. But um, when you look at Grover Norquist and you look at the you look at the pledge, an essential part of of conservatism is a philosophy is you got to pay the bills, right? So if you want to have a prescription drug benefit under Medicare Part D, great got to pay for it. You want to have two wars? Got to pay for them. Um, all manner of programs that have been put on the credit card under Republican Congresses and under Republican presidents are at least in part responsible for the outrageous, you know, debt that this country has, making us more bankrupt than any country ever since the beginning of time. And we, have to, and we have to do something. We have to do something about it. And what we will have to do about it is to increase revenues to pay for it because the revenues collected against GDP are at a historic low by, by a couple of points. And the tyranny of the no new taxes pledge uh, by Grover Norquist, I'm happy to say that you have any one of a number of Republicans have said that they won't sign the pledge. Uh, the pledge has begun to fray, and people have rightfully said that the only pledge I'm going to take is the oath of office to the Constitution at the end of the campaign, should I, should I be sworn in. So you know, John Boehner has said that clearly new revenues are on the table. They need to be on the table. We're going to need to have cuts. We're going to need to have restructuring of these programs, and we're going to you know, need to have new revenues, but we need reality-based policies to deal with the country's fiscal situation. And I don't think you can let guys like Grover Norquist hold it over the, you know, hold it over the head anymore. And so we need guys in the party, serious people, the Bob Corkers, the Lamar Alexanders, to stand up and say enough. Tom, let me, Tom well, would you, how would you look at this, I mean, from, from the standpoint of, of taxes? And, and the upcoming fiscal cliff stuff. What do you think should happen? Well, I think Steve's basic point when you step back is we went from 1945 to 2008 taking basically the same percentage of GDP into the federal government pretty consistently over that period of time. And it's hard to say that wasn't maybe the most successful stretch for any country in the history of the world. So it's hard to say that that was a ridiculous amount of money to be taking in. And so we were taking somewhere around 20 or 22 percent. And right now it's down partially because of the recession and partially because of the tax rates. It's down kind of, it went as low as like 15 and it's down somewhere 15, 17. So we really went to a place that was unprecedented in terms of revenues. And the assumption was that in some way, shape or form, taking the lower rates was going to grow the pie that it was going to create growth, so we're going to take a lower percentage of a higher amount of money, and we're going to get enough money to fund the government. And actually, the, I think the right way to think about taxes is to start from a revenue base and to say, look, we went for a really long time really successfully, running the government basically effectively and without you know, going bankrupt for a long time, somewhere around 20 or 22%. So that my assumption is that's what we need. 
And when someone, and unless we get back there, we're gonna have a terrible time. The second thing I'd say is this, we know exactly what happens when people get past a certain point in terms of overall debt to GDP. The reason we're not really painful, painfully experiencing this right now is we have rates on our government debt that are at historic lows. You know, the government is paying a quarter of a percent per year on their debt. So it really doesn't matter if you have debt. At, when you pay no interest, you can have a trillion dollars of debt, you can have 10 trillion dollars of debt. There's no interest. But if you look at what happens when the markets start, start not to trust you to pay you back, if you have a trillion dollars of debt and all of a sudden they demand 5% interest, that's 5%, you know, we're at a point where that would be 4% of our GDP, suddenly is going just to keep our debt solvent. We haven't gotten a single program, we haven't paid for a single soldier, we haven't paid for a single school kid. We're just paying off the interest on our debt. So we know, and we know what's happened because Europe has already done this. We can see real time the kind of pain that they're going through in Southern Europe. We can see it in, all over the place. So there's no doubt in my mind that we have to get back to, this, to the kind of percentage, 20 to 22 percent. And then the question is, what is a fair rate? And you know, fairness is like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. And what's, the, the reason that I, 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 the two things that I look at for fairness, one is historical, you know, what did people pay in the past? And the other thing that's going on in terms of fairness that people aren't really talking about is this, which is we've seen, as, seen in a, a huge skewing of income levels across, you know, the United States. So the relative income levels of people who are working on the line at GM and the people who are running GM and the, the kinds of things that people are getting in the lowest paying jobs and the high paying jobs have gone like that. And so we, I don't think that there's been any vicious intent here, I really don't. I think that this is something that has happened because of technology and I think it's something that's happened because of globalization. Because right now, if you don't have a good education, the way the world is, the overwhelming fact of the investment world for the last 30 years of my life has been that tomorrow the world is going to be more globally integrated than today, and the day after tomorrow is going to be more globally integrated than tomorrow. So if you are a poorly educated person in El Paso, Texas, you are going to be competing with people in China, in Peru, in Southern Europe. It's just a fact, and it's going to be an increasing fact every single day, which is why you know, Jim is such, my brother Jim is such a fanatic about educating poor kids. Because not educating poor kids is basically relegating, it's basically stratifying our society at a very early and inescapable way. So when you think about what is a fair tax rate, you have to look and see what people are bringing in. And really what's happened is there's been, and I've been, you know, a huge beneficiary of this. So I'm speaking, you know, directly against my interest, and every time I've said this, my partners and friends have, you know, basically wanted to shoot me. But the fact of the matter has been a huge skewing, and as a society, that isn't healthy. It is not healthy to have a society where a few people are benefiting incredibly, and not in a vision, I don't blame people for this. I, this is not a normative statement, it's just an analysis. It is not good for us, we are really in one boat together. So when I look at tax rates, I have a different reaction from Steve, because when you look at it individually, do I think 35% is fair? Sure, I think 35% is fair, but there's no real answer to it. But the question is, as a society, if you really want to be an American and feel like you know, we're contributing in a real way, how, what is something that's going to get us a healthy society? Are we going to have enough revenues so that we do educate kids for the 21st century in an increasingly competitive global world? So I come out with a higher numbers than Steve. I really do, and I have no issue about it because I feel as if you know, people in the past, we, we have been increasingly asking less of our richest citizens. You know, I, I, I look at Jim's and my parents' generation and our grandparents' generation and our great-grandparents' generation, which is true for, I guess you guys have to add a great, a great onto every one of those. <laughs> they all went to war. They all were in the Army or Navy for generations. It was, you know, and that was a great leveling thing and people were giving something that was much more than a 35% tax rate at that point. So I see the American <coughs> experiment as much more inclusive and I hate to 
you know, have people let it devolve too much to just pure individuality because I feel as if we're really asking people to, you know, be, participate in a very large experiment, an incredibly successful experiment where you get great benefits and all those people at the top of the chain have great benefits. And I think it's completely fair to ask them to participate, to give back in a real way because what they've gotten, and I, I'm clearly one of the people who has gotten it, has been, you know, if you ask Warren Buffett, what, why has he done well? His answer is, I was born in the United States. That was the luckiest thing that could have happened to me if I'd born in, been born in another country. I would have had a completely different outcome. Tom, I, I happen to agree with you, and I think probably a lot of people in this room do, <clears throat> that uh, inequality is maybe the single deepest threat to our comedy as a society and our integrity as a country. Um, I just think it's deeply corrosive of the way we get along with each other and the way we regard each other and live together. But here's the question. To what degree do you think tax policy is a remedy for inequality? You know, my experience with organizations is that everything has to fit together. So that tax policy can never, I, I think it's, you know, you're, you need a tax policy. When you run a company, you need an incent, you know, a pay policy, a compensation scheme. And the compensation scheme has to fit into the whole culture and theory of the organization. So you can't, you know, to have a tax policy devoid of value is meaningless. The tax policy has to fit the values of the country. So when I look at it, I, the, the real question I'm asking is what is it that we're trying to accomplish as a government or as a society? What is the social compact that we're agreeing to, you know, as Americans? So, you know, to me, I think we're devolving way too much. You know, you look at, you, you look at what, what is effectively offered to people, and politicians know that if you say, I won't ask anything from you and I will give you a lot of things, you tend to get elected, and that's what's been happening. So basically, tax policy has been, how do we ask the least from the most people and give the most to the most people, because that's going to be. But I think that that's terrible for our society, because I think our society is really about something more than that, which is, how are we going to contribute to this society so that we can get the great benefits from the society? And I think until we get back to those value-laden things, then tax policy is just a fist fight. And honestly, a, you know, it's a fist fight between interests and we're going to come out somewhere, but we're, and, and that's inevitably going to be part of this, but that can't be all of it. When I listen to what Steve is saying about the Republican Party, which I absolutely believe has to be healthy, the thing that I see missing there and which he is saying he sees missing there is a reality-based value system that is trying to reach out and include as many Americans as possible. And, and you know, ta a tax system is just part of that. And I, so, you know, I think the first question I would ask is, how are we as a society thinking out 10 years to be successful? And part of that is certainly about our kids. And then there's a whole bunch of things in, in terms of economics that have to be done, that have to be addressed. And how are we going to do that and how are we going to pay for it in the fairest way? Let's, let's bring that conversation since when in your opening remarks, um, you, you, you called lots of attention to California as a bellwether. So we've got super majorities of Democrats now in the California um, legislature. Um, uh, Prop 30 passed, so we're at least out of some um, immediate short-term consequence in terms of education. Uh, um, if California is a bellwether state that might imply something for DC uh, and, the, and the rest of the country, what, what's, the, what's the solution locally? I, I, well, in my opinion, I'm hoping that California will not be leading in the way the Republican Party chooses to face what I, what I think Steve is saying is kind of a you know, coming to Jesus moment. Looking yourself in the mirror and saying, are we going to hunker down and be a minority party or are we going to rethink some basic things and try and become a majority, reach out and be a majority national party? And if you look at Californian Republicans so far, they've taken the, the first choice, which I think has been, you know, you can look, just look at election results and say that there's no statewide elected official from the Republican Party. There are super majorities for Democrats. 
I really hope, I, I mean, as a Democrat, right. that is not a healthy state of society. You need to be pushed. You need to be competitively pushed. You need to be thinking, you know, fresh all the time. The Democrats have sufficient super majorities in Sacramento now to pass yeah. revenue legislation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two-thirds, both chambers? Think that'll happen? I, I don't. I mean, I, I've been talking to some of the people, and I think that there's an awareness of the risks of, <laughs> of that. <clears throat> and I think they're just, we just passed two revenue right. uh, props two days ago. So we are in better shape. But this is a state which spends, we're the 37th most per pupil in the United States of America, which is shocking. And we're the 47th best educational system in the United States. So to think that we don't have real needs, you know, we've had a decade of crises and, you know, we've been starving our social programs. Is that, Steve, let's go ahead, Sam. Go ahead. That's what the tax system helps you address. You know, you don't address inequality directly well, to some extent, you do through your tax policy, but but uh, but your your ability to make investments in education is one of the things that your tax system does for you. And then, in a second order way down the road, perhaps ameliorates uh, you know some of the some of the excess inequality you know that is that is part of the American ex experience. And, and I think a certain amount of it has to be tolerated. It, it's that kind of a society. But uh, I think where we've gotten to lately is is, is a bit in excess of where we've been over the longer haul. Uh, but but at, at the very least, you don't want your tax system to be contributing <laughs> further to inequality. I, but to think of tax per se as a way to, you know, in, the, in a direct way to wipe out inequality, I think is, is, isn't sort of the way you should be thinking necessarily yeah, yeah. about your tax policy. I just want to do a, a follow up on this discussion with Steve. So Steve, you said earlier to me and Tom, you think it's a disaster for the Democratic Party I California. think it's a disaster for the state. Um, look, I, you know, the Republican Party has collapsed as an institution in the state, and it's had a profound warping effect on the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party in this state doesn't resemble the Democratic Party in other states. This is a public employee union yeah. interest group disguised as a legislature. <laughs> and mark my words <laughs> on this, that um, the notion that Proposition 30 ended the fiscal crisis yeah, in this state, yeah. that... The, there won't be a budget hole next year and the year after. There will now be a flood of legislation um, that comes through this state with Jerry Brown, the goalie. And um, I just have to tell you that it, it, there, are, there, are, there are dark days ahead because the last vessel of restraint, um, wacky as it may be, um, in this state, and it is wacky, trust me, I've met all of them. Um, uh, uh, it, it, is, it, is a, it is going to be um, more legislation, more bills that make the state more uncompetitive, less economically healthy, um, more extreme environmental measures, and I'm an environmentalist, um, that will prevent building, construction, new jobs, and make California a, a more difficult place to operate and to, to do business. It is not providential that when you look at the biggest tech companies in the world that are all born and bred in California, uh, why is it uh, that they are now um, building facilities in uh, Salt Lake City and in Austin, Texas and in uh, Reno, Nevada? Um, and you will see more and more outnight migration of, of jobs. And, you know, here's a statistic, is that if you look at the state of California uh, from the gold rush on, so for the last 20 years, this was a net emigrant state. People came to California uh, to start over for, for opportunity. And over the last 10 years, you've had an outflow of population totaling 4 million people from California. Who are they? Their average ages are between 2 and 9 and 35 and 44. They are otherwise known as middle-class tax-paying families. And the net migration into the state, some out, out, astounding number of them, over 70%, are some type of net recipient of government aid. It doesn't work. The math doesn't, the math doesn't add up. And one of the great case studies um, that should be studied everywhere is how the richest place, California, and the richest country the world has ever known has gone bankrupt over the last 15 years. From the best primary schools 
to among the worst, from a university system that was envy of the world that has collapsed, uh, to a infrastructure system that was the model for the world that is in a state, in a state of collapse. And um, it's not the Republican Party's fault, because the Republican Party has had very little influence in this state um, over the last over the last decade or so. Here's another implication of what you're saying that uh, in the 2010 reapportionment of congressional seats and lest we forget electoral college votes which track that uh, for only the second time since California became a state in 1850 California did not gain a single seat. Right. The only, only other time was 1920 and Texas gained four which is just about historically unprecedented. But with the demographic yeah, right. changes going on, soon it will be <laughs> a uh, very stable democratic state in the Electoral College. Absent. Texas becomes more purple every day. But ab absent some kind of renaissance inside the Republican Party that the Democratic Party undertook, you know, where did Bill Clinton come from? You know, that, that soul searching inside the Democratic Party trying to identify uh, a new generation of leaders that, that would be viable on the national stage. But this suggests, let me ask you guys a question, because a lot of what you were saying, Steve, is ultimately one, is about leadership. I mean, I thought your comments about Rush Limbaugh, I didn't even know who that guy Levin is, but I can assume I know. He so, it sounds like he's a lot like him. But here's my question. Where do you think that what we're going to see, I say this to Tom, I say this to Simon, that we're going to see a whole new generation of leaders? That's one question. And the second is, is Barack Obama smart enough in his second term now, unfettered by any need to get reelected ever again, to actually push right. the country in that direction? Two, two separate questions. Well, it is true that historically, most presidents have not had successful second terms. Uh, you know, most presidents have had uh, very difficult second terms, those that, those that have had them. So, you know, right from the beginning, um, you know, the, the president has been reelected. He has had a uh, broad electoral college mandate, uh, but he is also the first reelected president since Woodrow Wilson, whose coalition shrank, number one. Um, and though the victory was decisive, 55 million Americans voted for Mitt Romney to be president in a 50-48 national election. Um, the president is the president of all the people. Um, is he going to govern and fulfill the promise of Barack Obama that we saw in 2004, that we're not red America, we're not blue America, we're the United States of America, because this country needs to have a leader and leaders who are repairers of the breach that has, that has opened up. And that is the domain of the, of the President of the United States. And it will be interesting to see uh, how he governs and how he reaches out, because there is no question he will have ample cause and reason on any given day to be extremely agitated with a lot of people in my, in my party um, and, frankly, in his party. Um, but how will he deal with that? How will he transcend it? Um, if you go and you read the Reagan Diaries, for instance, or you read the Caro books on, on LBJ in the White House, they spent an enormous amount of time dealing with the members of Congress. They were over at the White House, they were in the bowling alley, they were in the movie theater, they were in the residence, they were working them constantly to get an agenda through, to get an agenda passed. They were about establishing relationships. And so in the case of John Boehner and, and Mitch McConnell, it would just be a healthy exercise if they got together and said, what are 10 small things we can agree on and do? They don't have to be big things. Um, they could be small things, they could be medium things, but what are things that we could start working on that we could say yes to and, and move forward and to start to slowly chip away at the total dysfunction and frozen processes that, that prevent any forward motion on, on some big issues. And, you know, but, that, but that's, you know, the, the, president has to, the president has to do that. And, um, and we'll, see, we'll see what he does, but he'll, but he'll control his own destiny on that. Jim, on can, that I, front. can I address that? Because sure. I, I think the first thing that Obama said on Tuesday night was an attempt to reach out. No doubt. Absolutely an awareness on his part that even though people had forgotten the fiscal cliff in the excitement of the election, I think he knows that his presidency depends on a reasonable, resolute compromise on this. 
And I think the very first thing he did was to say, you know, we pretty much exactly what Steve said. You know, I have to be a president for all the Americans. I know I have, the, the Republicans and we have to come together on this. This isn't something that any one party, just do the math, can, uh, can control. And therefore, he, he really did reach out on the very, uh, on before the election was, you know, as soon as the election got called. Yeah, so you know, Tom, I, actually, I disagree with you. Uh, the, uh, I, I agree that the, his presidency, indeed the health of the country, in the immediate future depends on this kind of reconciliation between uh, these various uh, factions. Uh, but I, I was struck by how absolutely minimal was the gesture across the aisle from both candidates on uh, Tuesday night. Both Romney and uh, uh, Obama said no more than maybe a sentence or two uh, by way of deference to the opposition. I, I thought it was quite minimal. Let me say this. I'm actually, if you believe my original premise, which is that California forecasts yeah. what's going to happen to the country, it, what, it, we've lurched from crisis to crisis. And if I, you know, I believe Obama is going to make a very sincere effort to overcome what is a very tough cultural divide. And I, I genuinely believe he will try his darndest to overcome that. And I, you know, obviously we should all be hoping that he's successful and he's got to be met at least part way. I, I agree with Tom on this. I, I thought his, I thought the speech was very gracious that it was, that it was reaching out. I thought it was a big speech. I, I thought the line where he talked about whether he held a Romney sign or an Obama sign, I thought it was, I thought it was a very, I thought it was a very good speech, but this is something that is more about deed than word in the, in the days I ahead. Know. But I, I'd like to make a different point, which is this. There are two things that go on. In normal times, people can proceed and they can kind of do their party politics and they can, you know, their little fights. But in, when you really have crises, crises actually produce leaders because there is someone who's out there who's telling the truth before the crisis. There's someone who has thought it through and, is, and has answers and is willing to fail in order to tell the truth. And so if you look back to the great crises in the, in the United States or in the world, there was someone out there in 1933 in England telling the truth and completely cast aside. But by the time that, that you know, it really came to the crisis, that was the person everybody turned to. In, you know, in the 1858, there was someone in the United States who was willing to, who was unelectable, lost, 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 lost every election, but was out there willing to tell the truth and the facts bore him out. And so the thing that I think happens in politics that people don't like to take into account is they look at the short term and they look at the polls and they know what works in the polls and that's what they do. But long term, the facts will happen. So that if there is climate change, people who have denied climate change will be thrown into the ash heap of history. And ultimately someone, if we really have a fiscal crisis, which I believe we do, telling the truth and being ahead of time and being the leader in that is what you get paid for. It, answering the tough questions is what parties, is, that's really where you earn your stripes and you earn people's devotion for a long period of time by standing up in the things that are unpopular that people don't believe, but being right about them. And David, I have a question for you because you've studied this as much as any historian and President Obama, you don't have to describe all the conversations you've had, but he's had you at the White House several times to talk about this in the sweep of great sweep of history because he sees them. There was a big article in the New York Times this week about that. For, I'm sure many of you read it, that, about Professor Kennedy and some of the other historians who visited since 2009 with Obama. Where do you think, you're gonna, where do you think he's gonna be? Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm not at liberty to go into detail right. about those conversations. But on but this, the, but how do you think, what, from what you know, uh, how we'll handle uh, it? My hope is, and I think there's reason to think this is a reasonable hope, is that he'll double down on the kind of conciliating uh, persona that he tried to affect uh, in the first two years of his first term. So I, I think you're right that he's going to make a strenuous effort. Uh, there have been accounts in recent days about how in, though he cast himself in that kind of a role in the first two years, he actually didn't play it out in as much granular detail as he should have. He didn't have congressional delegations into the White House, so on and so forth. Steve's point about the bowling uh, yeah, alley yeah. and all the meetings. So may, maybe we're going to see some of that more retail kind of uh, version of it. But, but I, I do think this is the way he thinks of himself as a conciliator, a mediator, a reconciler. I think he's temperamentally very well positioned to play that kind of a role if he takes it right down to the ground. 
is there much scope on the other side to to respond? Can can Speaker Boehner credibly commit with rivals, one of whose name was just mentioned previously, looking look, over his shoulder? Look, but if you if you I think if you read the if you read the Woodward book that goes into some great detail about the debt ceiling debate and the negotiations and the grand bargain and how close they they got, there's blame enough to go around on all sides. It was not simply a case of Republican intransigence. And the one thing I would disagree a little bit uh, with David on in, in the first two years of the Obama administration is that we go back from day one, Democrats controlled all the bodies of government and they didn't need under our system to have Republican acquiescence to any of the policy prescriptions. And so what was the first thing that was, that was done? It was the stimulus. And um, this was, um, you know, in my view, um, may have been nominally effective in the economy, could have been more effective, but it was a giveaway of a trillion dollars to a lot of interest groups in the, in the Democratic Party. And when, when uh, Rahm Emanuel po posed the question, or posed to Rahm Emanuel the question, you know, how do we work with the Republicans? You know, how do we put something together that they can vote for, that we don't have a, uh, a, a partisan first vote on a big thing? He said, F them. We have the votes. And so that tenor from day one uh, set the tone. And um, Republicans are, are, are guilty of you know, many, many things on the, on the obstruction front, uh, but the Obama administration has not been pure on this front. And so um, as you go forward, um, you know, I think it is the duty of the president um, to be bigger than his opponents in these in these situations, and that's what he's now called on to do. And so, I think characters revealed. One of my favorite quotes about an American president is what General Sherman said about Lincoln um, after Lincoln was assassinated. And Sherman, who, when Lincoln became president, and as Tom pointed out, in 1858, Lincoln, a backwoodsman who was unelectable, gangly, and awkward, and Sherman was very critical of him and, you know, said of Lincoln many of the things that were said about George W. Bush, you know, when, in 2000, very similar. He was unqualified. He was awkward. He was uneducated. How could this oaf be, be the president of the United States? He met him only twice. And he met him for the last time at City Point in Virginia at the end of the war uh, with Grant, where Lincoln gave instructions about how to wind down the war and to leave the politics to him. And, and then after that meeting, uh, which went on for some time, and after the assassination, Sherman was asked his recollections of Lincoln by a reporter. He said, what was the real Lincoln like? And he said, you know, of all the men I've ever met um, in my life, and I've met many great men, he said he possessed more of the qualities of greatness and goodness than any other. And that speaks to the character of the American president. And now, you know, Barack Obama is a historical figure um, by virtue of his presence in the White House. Uh, he has four years left now uh, to make um, a impact on this country and to build a legacy that, that will be an enduring one. And I just believe that you can't leave the White House if you're Barack Obama in four years with the same level of polarization in the country as exists today and worsening every day and have had a successful presidency. And so as difficult as it may be, um, there are other presidents who have had challenges that are as great or even greater. And if he's to go down as a great president or a near great president, this is an issue he's going to have to be able to get his arms around. That's as good a place to come to an end as I can think of. Thanks very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.